there's a lot of strangeness in the community right now. I'm starting to see it in a lot of places. We're getting very comfortable, which is great. We're coming out of the broom closet and we're letting people know that we're practicing, but we're starting to divide. We can't let that happen. I'm seeing a lot of discourse that Wiccans aren't witches and what are Druids even doing here? <laughs> All of this. And like we covered in our joint revival of witchcraft and Druidry episode, we have a lot more in common. We need to stop the division. One of the things that's really vital in our practice is an understanding of the difference between Druidry and witchcraft and how they actually work very well together. So we're going to talk about Druidcraft today as we walk down Creation's House. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie. I am a Christopagan Druid and Priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian. I am a mischief maker and sous chef to the Dagda. Today we're going to be talking about Druidcraft. Part of this is going to be based off of Philip Cargom's book, all of the practices that are in there. There's a beautiful Bridget practice in there with candles and everything that I absolutely love. It is one of those books that I have come to use almost as a devotional. It's so soothing to read and I love the audiobook version of it because it's him and his family. The audiobook is wonderful and I will often put it on in the background when I'm going to sleep as just like a happy release from the stress of the day. Druidry and witchcraft are different, even though they share similar origins in the revival in the 1700s, but they can click together in a way that will make your daily practice more interesting. And I really want to talk about that. But before we get into it, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology is on the app that you're currently listening to us on. It really does help us out. And wow, a lot of you have been doing that lately. And thank you very, very much. It's amazing to see the growth that we've been having, that what we're talking about is resonating with people. Also, thank you for the comments. Y'all have been really, really good about that too. And for the new people that are joining on the paid membership tier, uh, y'all are amazing. And I hate to sound like I'm love bombing or anything, but like, I'm a little blown away. <laughs> y'all are really great. Thank you so much. I want to get back to the topic and stop gushing. One of the more interesting things that happened, especially with Ross Nichols' version of Druidry, which, like we said in our joint revival episode, isn't the only version of Druidry that's out there, but it follows in the footsteps of the kind of Yellow Morgano school of Druid revival, treats Druidry like a mystery school, not so much like a magical practice. There are magical practices that are available to Druids that are taught in Obot and in AODA, many of the other Druid orders. There's also a lot of Hedge Druidry out there for people and Peregrine Druidry out there for people who are not a member of one of the Druid orders. And that's great. That's wonderful. But because the Druid revival came about through this lens of restarting a mystery school, there's a very head-oriented way of doing Druidry that is very different from what you see in Wiccan witchcraft. It's, it is embodied. There's a lot of go out to nature, be amongst the trees, you know, study the world. But there's a lot of that study side of things. It's very mystical. Don't take this as an insult. I love Druidry and I love the way it's taught. But it's not a very practical pass. It's very philosophical. Maybe might be the best way of saying it. Yeah, I like the imagery of the head versus the heart. I know you didn't say heart, but in a way that was implied, where a lot of the witchcraft practitioners have that it's more intuition, it's more gut, it's from the heart, it's from that more free-flowing, less structured. And in Druidcraft, like you said, like a school of mystery, it's more intellectual, it's more in the head, it's more of a philosophy. It has a lot of more of that structure in there. Druid magic is very elemental and it's very much more theurgy, aligning ourselves with nature, working on ourselves, bettering ourselves, helping to get ourselves to that place of more enlightened relationships with the forces of nature. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm not knocking any of that. 
But once you start tapping into these energies, there is this desire for this more witchy element to things. I don't think Druidry is for everyone, like the exact practice of Druidry is for everyone that everybody is going to want to go to the mystery school. You can learn the concepts, you can learn the ideas, but that deeper road in may not be for everyone. What I found with my own practice, because I came up in mystery schools from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and some of its descendants and a couple others that I just, I'm not going to start naming names, I'll be here all day. Those kinds of mystery school magical orders are wonderful, they're beautiful, they really help you in achieving the great work. They're really good at helping you find and focus and do a lot of the shadow work and the work on you that you're wanting to do, but they don't really talk all that much about the practical every day. Witchcraft to me is practical every day. I'm not saying you can't have philosophical witchcraft. You can. I'm not saying that you can't have mystery school witchcraft. You definitely can. Old school Wicca is that. It's, it's a mystery school that you set up for do a course. And there's still some of that closed practice still in existence today. When I think of witchcraft, I, I again, I think of the cunning folk. I think of the people in my family who, when anything went wrong, somebody came over and visited my great-grandfather because they knew Doc knew how to fix it. Yeah. What do you think of the solo practitioner who just starts experiencing things and doing things and then trying this and trying that? A lot of that experimentation, but it's a lot of free flow, less structured. They pick up something here, they pick up something there. Witchcraft, to me, fits into this picture really, really well. Because, in a way, Druidry is a philosophical worldview. It is a way of understanding all of the things that you're doing, understanding yourself, and is that layer on things that, like I said, it does have its magic practices. I'm not trying to take away from that. But it is compatible with whether or not you are a chaos magician, whether you're an intuitive witch, a green witch, if you're coming at it from the point of the fairy faith and doing fairy magic, they can slot into one another very well and play with each other really, really well. Because when I look back at our Celtic ancestors, everyone wasn't a druid. Druids were a specific class. They were the ritualists. They were the ones that led the services. They led the high holidays. They led the rituals. They also had a legal role in helping to adjudicate and bring peace between groups. They were seen as healers. Even when you read the oldest stories in the mythological cycle, we see them bringing in witches, healers, and druids as three distinct groups of people. And they all worked together as part of a continuum. I think that's something we've lost in modern paganism. Because it stayed that ism. It's very in our head. We did a whole episode on this about pagan re versus paganism. And re is the act of doing, whereas ism is all of the thoughts and philosophy that goes with things. Let me shift your focus for a moment. One of the ways I found helpful in organizing my thoughts with all of this, you have first your faith and works. These are two different plates. They intersect often and quite a lot. But they're different planes. So you have how you're doing your works. Are you working with nature? Are you working with technology? Are you working with home crafts? Are you working with ancestors? What, what, are, what are the tools you're working with? And then you have the faith part that is more of the energies and how you're working with the subtle energies, interacting with the subtle energies. And that's where you find your chaos magic, your green witch, elemental magic on that level. They're not exclusive. They can go in between. That's where you can f see that. I also like to think of it in terms of focusing lenses. You have different focusing lenses can cut out different spectrums of light. Playing with the prism, you get to see that, or you can make a rainbow instead of different colors of white. It's the same kind of thing. You have these different focusing lenses. The focusing lenses for your work, the focusing lenses for your faith, for the spirit, for the subtle energies operations. In understanding that, it also helps seeing that a lot of these differences aren't differences. They're existing solely to corrupt, to separate, distract, to weaken the practitioners so that they aren't as strong. As somebody who came to Druid through the fairy faith, I see them in a very compatible way. Fairy magic is something that I have done for, oh, I, well, I want to say my entire life. I would say, yeah. Because even as a small child, you have some of the stories yeah. where you've had those interactions. 
as I became more and more involved with Druidry, the fairy magic has always stayed there. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me and think that I'm saying, well, Druids should be the religious caste or anything like that. I'm not saying that they are necessarily the priesthood or anything. I just think that for my own spirituality, when I am going to do something, if it is going to be in an elaborate ritual for aligning myself with the seasons or aligning myself with nature or celebrating a major holiday, my mind tends to flow more in the druidic way. For my practical day-to-day life, I'm making offerings to the other crowd. I am working on my altars with the other crowd. I am working with my fetch to better myself and figure out where I need to go. It feels weird to say it this way, but my more mundane, regular life, I'm using a lot more of that fairy magic than I am any of the more philosophical, almost more impersonal druidic ideas that are out there. Because Druidry does feel a bit impersonal to me. And I think that's one of the things that people have against it. That's not a bad thing. When I'm trying to understand my place in the cosmos, when I'm trying to understand the world and all of the chaos in it, when I'm dealing with those bigger picture issues, Druidry is that focusing lens that I tend to go to. But for everyday things, I'm having a swabble with somebody who's treating me really bad. I'm going to be talking to the other folks. Yeah, I'm going to be talking to the other crowd. And we're going to be plotting and seeing how can we make the situation better. I think that's one of the other solutions to this is remembering that there are many paths and there are many ways to do the things. There are a lot more similarities. Like a lot of these paths run side by side. In a way, you could think of them, they're just lanes on a freeway. You're in your lane, they're in their lane. You're actually driving beside each other. So you may go a little faster, maybe a little slower, but you're still there. You're still heading in the same direction. They may have to stop for a rest stop or whatever, and you keep going, but then you're going to run into each other again. Think of it like a long drive. You see that same car over and over again. There's so many things that are shared that are similar and remembering that. And remember, they're siblings. It's just like with siblings. It's the same thing with siblings. You share genetic stock with your sibling, though you may run different paths. They're still very, they have a lot of similarities and it's recognizing the differences, but not allowing the differences to separate or divide. It, in them being siblings, I kind of look at them as both of them are Cardwin's children. You have Morfan who is off with his books. He is off with his studies, working in the background, working in the shadows, working in the darker places. That's Druidry. Just thinking through the problems plotting, thinking, doing things. And witchcraft to me is much more Kiri. She's out in the daylight. She's doing her work out in the light, doing all of the things that she has to do. And I'm not saying that she, that witchcraft to me is all solar or anything. Druidry is lunar or anything like that. It's just as children of Cairdwin, I see this interplay between them. Remember, Morfan was supposed to get the Awen that Taliesin or Guyan at the time accidentally stole that entire story that potion was being made for Morfan. I know he has another name, but I'm afraid that the auto transcribers are going to uh, mess it up and get us in trouble. Know that I do know the other name and I usually use the other name, but we're going to go with Morfan for this. When I started thinking about him that way, and this actually came from my Druidry practice where I was in meditation with Morfan and Kiri, just this image of Morfan sitting at his desk working out the solar alignments and how all of the stars align and doing that deep divination work and all the things that I associate with Druidry. And there's Kiri out with the other crowd as somebody who practices the fairy faith and fairy magic out with the other crowd, having mischief, having fun, doing the things that need to be done, the much more practical day-to-day down-to-earth kinds of things. That's how I have balanced the idea of the craft and druidry. When our allergies are bad, I, I go to what I've learned in the craft. And here is a, a potion. Let's, let's be honest with there. Here's a potion, a tea that we can make that are, that just the vapors of it are going to help with our sinuses. Also drinking it will help with the inflammation that's going on with the allergies. That kind of work is what comes naturally to me. Trying to stay in that place. I don't think we need to be at odds with each other. I've seen this more and more and more, especially in the online, I don't want to say war, but tug of war going on 
between whether or not a Wiccan can call themselves a witch. Yes, no one owns the word witch. No one. Your tradition doesn't own it. My tradition doesn't own it. And dear God, the church doesn't own it. It really confuses me when I see that stuff, honestly, at my core, because my understanding is witch is just somebody that works with the subtle energies. That's the definition. That's it. If you work with subtle energies, congratulations, you're a witch, period. If you're a Christian, that's how you get Christian witch, because they're Christians through faith working with subtle energies. Witch. Congratulations. Ta-da. That's a miracle worker. They're a witch. It's the same thing if you're a druid and you're working with the subtle energies, you're a witch. And that's where I get confused. Like, I understand the difference between a druid and a Wiccan just because they had their parentage comes from... You know, someone's like shared daddies. They shared a magic sword together. That's really intimate. That's like, that's at least like work wife level of intimacy. Yes. They, they were work husbands. They were work husbands. <laughs> they were craft husbands. Craft. Yeah. One of the ways my brain wraps around this is I, I am a big believer in fate. I think that fate is a thing that we have and a thing that we can alter and change. In my way of seeing this, I use one Irish word and one older English word. The reason for that is I don't like the older English word. The older English word is borlog. Mm. And I, I just don't like saying it. I don't like saying it. It's, it doesn't make me happy. So I say the Irish word Donna. Donna is your fate. It is your craft. It is the work that you do. It's what you're born with. It is your innate talent. It's what you got from your ancestors. It is what has come down to you. It is your tradition. It is all of that. To me, the Druid is the one who works with Donna. The druid is the one that works with that fate that you have been given and tries to figure out how to make the best of it. Whereas witchcraft works with the weird. I'm talking about the fun kind of weird, the, the weird with a Y, W-Y-R-D. Weird is the fate that you make. It's the fate that you weep. It's not set in stone. It's very fluid. It's the fate that you can change. It's all the things that are up in the air that you can edge the percentages on. That is what witchcraft works on. That is the purpose of the craft. You are messing with your weird. You're trying to get it ever flowing in the direction that is good, beneficial, and healthy for you. So while Druidry is aligning me to my Donna and helping me understand where I'm coming from, my craft is helping me steer my future fate to where I need to be. I come at this from a Stoic point of view because I love the Stoic definition of fate. And this relates to the uh, Irish idea of Donna. Everything that's already happened to you was fated because it's in the past and you can't change it. So that's your fate. Everything going forward is your weird. When I practice, that really is how my practice gets divided. Now, I'm not saying I never do any druid things that mess with my weird and that my Donna never affects my craft. They, they do, but primarily, this is how they tend to break out in my own personal practice. And once I understood that, I realized I needed both because Druidry really does kind of deal with that. How do you work with your innate talents? How do you work with what you were born with? The current nature of the world, the seasons, the times and everything, and is very observational in that way because it is a practice of alignment. And Druid magic is very much about aligning yourselves. Whereas the fairy magic that I practice, the fairy craft that I practice is very playful. Rituals are very simple. Sometimes I light a candle. Sometimes I don't light a candle. Sometimes they're just some words that are spoken. Sometimes it's just an offering that I leave out at the place that we greet the fae. I know never to call them that to their face. It's much more playful. I need both of those in my life. I'm not trying to say that everybody needs to have a druid practice. I think a lot of people would benefit from a druid practice. They do think we need to start looking more at how we can bring the various things that we're doing together. I don't see, for example, a difference in what I do with chaos magic and what I do in, in my fairy craft. Because you know what? I found out the other folk love sigils. Yeah. They, they really do. It is a fun way to work with them and to engage them. My sigil work comes in there, and I don't see a lot of fairy craft practitioners talking about working with the other crowd in sigils. And maybe that's an episode we should do. In my own practice, I found that they love sigils. They love being involved in the inspiration for how they should look and what they should be, how they should be arranged, and how they should be empowered. There are some in the other crowd that are more than willing to help empower those sigils 
to help maintain them and keep them working. There are those that would say you can't be a chaos magician and somebody who practices fairycraft. Or if you do, they're separate and distinct things. They're, they're not. Magic is magic. Like we said in our What is Magic episode, which if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. Magic is an energy. It is a flow. We're all here trying to figure out how to channel that flow in the best way. We have all of these tools that are out here. While many of us are getting eclectic in our pantheons, we're not getting so eclectic in our practice. I think it actually might work better the other way around. Find some deities, some guides, some guardians, some gods that you can really connect with and develop relationships with. Because the better those relationships, the better the workings with them will be. But be eclectic in the styles of magic that you are doing. Maybe you need to be doing more pouches, more candle work, more spells, more rituals. Maybe you need to be celebrating your holidays better to root yourself in firmer. Maybe you need to be doing sigil magic. Maybe you just need to simplify it all down and just brew yourself teas and be a kitchen witch. I don't know. There are times when I sit back and go, maybe I'm just a kitchen witch. Honestly, when you have that point of conflict, that's when you need to pull out your journal and make a note. That is a point that you need to work on. In all the practices across the board, they all are about resolving the conflict at their core. So if there is a conflict, if there is some struggle or issue, that is a point to reflect and contemplate upon, bring healing to it, which could be simply your own personal healing. Because there's some people that actually resonate strongest with Christian magic, basically. But because of injuries in their past or injustices that they learned about, they've been put in conflict. So they're now trying to force themselves through a different lens. And, and it's a translation that gets lost. It's like a second language. You might get really good at a second language, but it's still a second language. And it's resolving that conflict. So that in healing that, you can return to what calls to your heart the most. And sometimes that may change as we change throughout our lives. Once again, in our practice, we recognize the seasons and the changing seasons. We may hit a season change where suddenly what called to you doesn't call to you strongly. Something new is calling to you strongly. And it's okay to look into that. Don't worry so much about being wrong. You need to practice basic spiritual hygiene, make sure you're doing your banishings, make sure you're closing your circles if you do use circles in your magic, make sure that you're doing the basic things that you need to do to keep yourself safe. But at the same time, my magical journey started with the works of DJ Conway. And no shade on DJ Conway, but those are very light, fluffy books. Like especially once you really dig into the craft. But one of the first books I ever read that Suri gave me into this was her book, Celtic Magic. And I had no idea how to practice after reading that book. It's basically, there. did you know there are these people called the Celts? Here's the Irish mythology. Here are their gods. Here's the, the Welsh mythology. Here's their gods. Da, da, bye. There wasn't a lot of meat on those bones, but it was enough that when I was in middle school and I read that book, it stirred something in me and got me starting to think differently and how this could relate to what I was doing. When I was going through my practices with the orders I was with, while they were using the Egyptian gods, which I find found interesting, or the Greek gods, which I found interesting, but had no connection to, I would talk to whoever I was working with and be like, so can I use these names instead? Is it all right if I trade these names out because moon god, moon god, da, da, and try this instead? And because they were older and wiser than me and they were the place that I'm at now, they were like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's fine. They helped me do, do those changes. And so I found that road in through, like I said, fairly light books. I would say they're 100 level, they're intro to magic level, like very, very basic books. Don't worry. It's called a practice for a reason. It is going to deepen, it's going to develop, it's going to grow. You just have to find a road in. If something like this is really interesting to you and you've never read Philip Pergam's book, Druidcraft, I highly recommend it. It's a really good place to start. Like I said, I don't practice in exactly the way that is presented in this book, but in my mind does automatic editing. It leans into the Wiccan idea of the uh, duotheism, where you have the god and the goddess. And so my mind just inserts the queen and the lord for the season that I'm in, which is fun because whatever season we're in, it becomes this blank slate. So in spring and summer, I'm hearing one set of names. And in winter and fall, I'm hearing a different set of names in my head. It works for me in that way. Beautiful book. Love the audiobook. If you're into those things, really well produced, beautiful. 
text. It's a nice way to just, if you need a 101, if you need an intro, great place to start. Remember, that's all you're looking for is a place to start. If this doesn't jive with you, there are a lot of wonderful books on hedge ma magic and druid magic and fairy magic. Morgan Daimler has a whole series out about fairy magic if you're interested in them. There's a wonderful book called Druid and Magic that I highly recommend. The names of the authors are escaping me right now. It has an intro by Philip Cargom in it. Wonderful book. I recommend it. That's very much a DIY where they take you through the mythology of here's how druids are pretty depicted. What do you think their practices look like? Which is really, really interesting. It's a fun book to go through. Penny Billington's wonderful book on druidry. Christopher Hughes, wonderful book on druidry. There's a lot of really good stuff out there if you just need a place to get started. But I'm really frustrated with this animosity I'm seeing develop and there's room for everybody. I, I would not call myself a Wiccan. Other people might call me a Wiccan. I don't care. Yeah. Wiccans. I was, I was, was like, okay, yeah. Cool. Wiccans are welcome. Oh, thank you. They're welcome. Witches are yeah. welcome. Whatever path that you walk, we're all practicing magic. We're just using different words. If you can embrace that spirit, your craft will be better and your life will be a lot easier because you're not going to be in a whole bunch of weird turf wars that don't matter. Got to stop the turf in, wars. In the end, the strength of the practice is in connecting. If you're not connecting, you're just weakening yourself. Yep. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I hope this has helped you out. If you want us to dig into some of the topics, we kind of want to, a lot of the episodes we're doing right now, because this podcast is kind of new, we're, we're doing very one-on-one introductory episodes. But if you want us to dig in deeper, let us know. You can leave a comment if you're listening to us on YouTube or Spotify right there. And we'll get to see it. Thank you to everybody who has been commenting especially over on YouTube. And it really does brighten my day to see your comments every day. And wow, there's been a lot of them and they've been really good lately. Thank you so much for that. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if it says that you can leave us a comment that you don't notify us so we won't know that you did, please, you can comment there. That's great. Engagement is wonderful. But take that comment and go over to creationspass.com and click on chat. You can leave the comment there. We'll get to be able to see it and respond and everything there. While you're there, if you have any money, you can pass our way. You can sign up for a membership. It really does help us out a lot. You can also support me on Kofi and Patreon. I'm CE Dorset on both of those. We are thinking about opening a fourth wall account specifically for this fork. If that's something y'all would be interested in, let me know. I think we might end up doing that. It's looking more and more like we're going to be doing that. Probably eventually have a fourth wall, a Kofi and a Patreon because people have the platform they like to donate on and Pennies are great wherever they come from. We're about all about that interconnectedness. <laughs> all about that interconnectedness. But it really does help us out. That money goes to help us keep food on our, ta on our table, roof over our head, and the power on. So thank you to everybody who does that, especially the newer people that have been joining up. It really does warm my heart to know that we are having a positive effect on people's lives. All righty. As we are going out, I usually say a prayer to the one life. But today I'm going to do something that's slightly different as we're approaching and saw one. May the queen of the wind and the hunters stand with you as we march into this new year, as the courts are changing places and the new time is upon us. May they help you to find the path that you should walk and help you to deepen in the magic and mysteries of the season to come. Amen. Amen. <laughs>